Okay, so I'm recording now, just so you know. And okay. the purpose of this video is so that I can walk you through the paperwork that you would use with a buyer. And I want to explain it in a way that you'll know how to best explain it based on whatever the scenario is that, that you're working with as a buyer. But essentially, the paperwork that I'm going through is everything you would use with a buyer paperwork-wise, uh, except for a few things that you'll have to pull from the listing. So any any disclosures that the other side does that the buyer has like in, in the MLS, you'll have to pull into like dot loop for signatures and um, uh, like property condition disclosure, lead paint, um, agricultural disclosure. Those type of things aren't gonna be in this video um, because those you're gonna pull from somewhere else and then you know, you'll, you'll be able to answer questions. But when we do the seller paperwork, explanation of paperwork, that's when we'll go into some of the details of some of those other disclosures in more, you know, in more detail, like property condition disclosure. Well, what does this question mean? We'll go through some of that type of stuff. And then the generic is, this is based on my experience. I'm not an attorney. If I was, I wasn't yours. Um, but if you have questions, the best person to ask is one, if you have a mentor, ask your mentor or your broker. Uh, so I'm just explaining it based on my experience. So it's not like I don't know what I'm talking about, but you know, you always have to have a disclosure about stuff like that. So I'm going to switch over here to the first form that we're going to do. This is the New York State Department of State uh, Agency Disclosure Form. The way I like to kind of preface a lot of the forms is that there are a lot of things that New York State wants to make sure you know about as you go through a real estate transaction. And every time there's something the state wants you to know, there's going to be a disclosure that you sign off saying you were told that. And that's the basic of, of why I say there's all this paperwork to do a transaction is mostly because of all the disclosures. So the state has some, you have some that are that are like national level, like an EPA form for lead-based paint disclosure. Uh, and then broker to broker, different brokers have different forms that they want in addition to all the other stuff. So the EXP Realty forms, the ones for our brokerage, is going to be all the way at the bottom because in the pecking order, that's kind of where they go, right? So, um, so when working with a buyer, if... Um, the way you're going to disclose the, the agency form is usually um, going to be over here, the buyer's agent. So when you're representing a buyer, you've worked with them, you know their private information, then you're representing them and their interest. So sometimes when, when I'm talking with a client, and you've probably seen me do this, is I'll make sure that, you know, I'm here to represent you and your interests. Or Will and I are here to represent you and your interests, and that's why we're telling you this house is jacked up, <laughs> you know, um, missing stuff. Or, you know, here's my concern about a single wide trailer that still has the tongue on the front, the towing tongue. Or your butt goes through the floor. Exactly. Yeah, that was like, holy mackerel. I didn't, even, I didn't even tell the listing agent about that one. But in a case like that, we're representing the buyer and their interest. And, and you know, it's always a balance because, you know, we have to tell them what we see based on our experience. But we're also not a home inspector. We're not an architect. But we want to, we want to share them concerns that we have. Although, you also don't want to talk them out of the house. But the thing is, when you're licensed, is you're held to a higher standard. So did you know that you fell through the floor because your foot did whatever? Well, yeah. Did you tell your client? Well, no. Well, you know, they put a couch down and it landed in the basement. <laughs> you know, so those are the situations where you just want to make sure that you're representing your client well. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go right through the buyer's agent. I'll, I'll even mark with a pen, you know, like I'm doing with my mouse here on the side saying, you know, this is the situation that we are the way I'm representing you. And then... Um, and then it carries over to the top of the, the form up here. And again, we're following fiduciary duties. We're, we're using reasonable skill, uh, reasonable care, undivided loyalty. So that means that, you know, if it's another EXP listing, then I have an obligation to both, but we'll get into that after. So this is a situation where, say, it's a Century 21 listing, 
and I'm showing it to a buyer. I have undivided loyalty because I'm only representing them as the buyer. It's not my, my broker's listing. So they have undivided loyalty, okay? Uh, confidentiality, what I say there is uh, everything we talk about is private and confidential between me, you, and nobody else, okay? So we can talk about those type of things. And, you know, I even showed property to a family member one time, and I said, you know, when I talked about confidentiality, I said, everything we talk about is private and confidential between me and you and not your aunt and your uncle. Um, you know, I made a point to specifically say that because, you know, that would have that would have been a concern. So um, let's see, I just wanted to get my right window back up here. So that's kind of how I'm going to describe that part of um, the buyer agency. And then it's also important to point out, too, where it says, um, you know, in dealing with the seller, a buyer's agent should do these things. So we are going to exercise reasonable skill and care in our duties. We're going to deal with um, the seller or the or the listing agent, really. We're going to deal with them honestly, fairly, in good faith, uh, disclose material things that we know, you know, like the things that we shared on our on our feedback that, hey, the washer and dryer weren't there and neither was the electric stove. And, you know, that that's that's being dealing with them fairly and honestly. And that's how we would want someone like if I had a listing and the utilities, you know, things like the washer and dryer were gone. I would want to know that and I'd be upset if somebody knew and they didn't tell me. Um, just like, you know, I had somebody showing one of my listings one time and they said, hey, did you know that the water's pouring down from because the pipes are frozen? It's like, no, I didn't know that, <laughs> you know, but thanks for telling me. Um, so we're, you know, but at the same time, when you're working fairly and honestly with um, the listing agent, it doesn't mean that you can say things that are confidential. Um, you know, like we talked about um, over, like over here, right? We still have to keep what's confidential, confidential, but, you know, we're, we're, we're also colleagues and if furniture's not there that's supposed to be there in a brand new listing, then obviously that's something that we're going to share with them. So that's a situation where uh, that's how I would describe the, the agency disclosure form uh, when it's another broker's listing, okay? That would, that would be the as a buyer's agent. And we'll go through that a little bit more on the next page. But there are situations where um, that might not be the only way that you represent them. And that's right here we're going to talk about next is dual agent. Dual agent is when you're representing the interests of both both sides, the buyer and the seller. Uh, and, and the situation that that might be is, um, say you've got a listing that comes on and you have a buyer you've been working with a long time and you know what they're looking for, you know their financials, you know how much they're willing to go and all that type of stuff, then you really are a dual agent because you have information on both sides that you have to keep from the respective parties. So when you do that, you have to be very careful because you have to represent them both equally. So what it comes down to it is some of the things that you can't do when you're a dual agent representing both people is you can't give them undivided loyalty because even though they had it when when maybe you looked at other listings, you don't always have that when when you're working, you know, a long time buyer and they say you've shown them 20 homes, you're not going to, you know, say, well, you got to go ask somebody else about this one. You know, you're still going to show it to them, but you have to explain about about the dual agent. And, you know, you'll have to say, you know, if they want to do an offer, as an example, on this property, I can't give you undivided loyalty because I'm also the listing agent. But I, what I can tell you is that I'm going to work with you fair, honestly, and, and, you know, the private information that I know about you, I'm not disclosing to the sellers, and the private information I have the sellers, I'm not disclosing with you because that wouldn't be fair to anybody. And I'm representing you both, and I often do it. Um, what I tell sellers is, you know, when I when I talk about dual agent is a lot of times people call from the sign. That's why it's in the yard, you know, but that's a different situation. So dual agent, you can't advise them on price. You know, if it's already listed and and your buyer, you know, if they've looked at enough homes, they probably know what they're going to offer. But you can't give them advice on what price to offer other than the list price is 
this price because then that would be not representing your seller by you know by disclosing you know to recommending a lower price to them so that one's just a little trickier but if you ever get into a sticky wicket with that then then just talk about it all right and then dual agent with designated representatives so that one's a little bit different than just dual agent so dual dual with designated means that it's an exp listing and uh, like if it's my listing and then you as another exp agent want to show it that situation is called dual with designated sales agents and if you read through here what you'll find and the way i describe it is that um you know, if you're a, if you're a buyer's agent, I'm representing you as the buyer, and Jim is the listing agent representing the sellers. That's also EXP Realty, and we keep everything private and confidential on the sides. And then, if there's any issues in in how that's going to work out, then our broker would come in and intervene. And the reason is because when you list a property, you know, like if I list a property, I'm listing it. With, I'm with the seller, with eXp Realty, not with Jim Jock. Jim Jock does the paperwork, but you're listing a property with eXp Realty. And that's why when another agent shows it, then that's how, you know, that's why it's a dual with designated. Okay. Questions on that one? No. So then the way I fill out the form in a case like that, first, this is me. This is who I'm with, Right. And I, I, I check here and I say, you're a buyer. And this says that I'm representing you as a buyer's agent. And then their name will be here and then they'll sign attesting to that fact. Okay. And that's how I, that's how I explain it. Um, when a property is listed, the advanced informed consent for dual agency and dual with designated is an option. So in other words, if, if those are checked on a listing and you wouldn't really have any other way of, of knowing other than asking the listing agent. Um, when I list a property, I, I check you're a seller and I'm a seller's agent. But then I check these two blocks here, which say in the case of where I have a longstanding client, just like I just explained, I'll tell that to the seller. And then that's informed consent of that way of representing a buyer. And I'll explain that in a case where another EXP agent wants to show it other than me, then we're both, you know, we both, you know, keep our private information private on each side of it. And when you check that on a listing, the advanced informed consent, then that is the seller's acknowledgement if that way of representation comes up. So when you sign down here at the bottom, like in this case, you're a buyer and I'm a buyer's agent. And it says, I, John Smith, I'm a buyer and he signs. If it was a case where um, it's an EXP, say, say, Will, you, you and I are both EXP agents. You're going to show one of my properties. Say it's going to be a dual with designated. If I wouldn't have done the advanced consent from the seller about dual with designated, then once the buyer signs, the sellers would also have to sign. Okay. But they don't have to agree to that. And that's, that's where it gets sticky. And that's why you always want to, as a listing agent, you always want to check these ad, ad, informed consents ahead of time. All right. So that's kind of how I describe it. Do, any questions on, on that? No. Okay. All right, so we're going to move to the next form is another New York State Department of State form. This one is the New York State Housing and Anti-Discrimination Disclosure Form. And the way, the way I describe this one is that um, housing is an option for everybody, and we're not allowed to discriminate in the housing process based on any protected class, whether it's a federal or state protected class. All right. And those are listed right here on the form for you. I won't read them because I know you can read and, uh, you know. Um, but and then here are examples of what some of that might look like. And that's pretty much what I say. That's how here's, here are examples of of how it might look like. And if you feel you've been discriminated against in the process of the housing 
um, process of buying, or in, in this case, buying, you have the right to file a complaint. And here's how to file the complaint right here. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes, no. If the buyer says no, then I said, because it's a disclosure, here's my name, here's your name, and you sign acknowledging that I told you about this disclosure. Pretty easy, right? Yep. And then the next one moves on to the property condition disclosure. The property condition disclosure, I don't have in this presentation because you always pull that from the listing because it's the, the listing agent or the seller is disclosing to us. But what this form does is this form tells the buyer, right, notice to buyers, that they have the right to receive that property condition disclosure from the seller. And if the seller doesn't provide it, they have to provide you a $500 credit against the purchase at closing. It's done differently in different markets, but in our market here in the North Country, we provide the property condition disclosure. So the only time you need to really use this form, um, sometimes I'll throw it out without with all buyers, so just so that they know that it's a requirement that the seller has to provide that information. Um, I think I've seen one in one listing, maybe once, where it said that the seller would give the five hundred dollars because they didn't want to do it. Correct. Yep. I think you and I were working on that. And in a case like that, I would have my my buyer sign this form. And then I would put that in the offer in place of the property condition disclosure. Okay. Yep. And there's also a seller one where the seller, you know, the seller has to acknowledge, you know, the right to a buyer to receive it or the seller has to pay that fee. And that's if they weren't going to do it. There are a few situations where the where the property condition disclosure are not required. Um, foreclosure properties are one of them. And estate sales are another one. And if you think of an estate sale, um, grandma or grandpa lived there for 100 years and who knows what they did to the property and who knows what problems they had with the property because, you know, I've, I've seen situations where Ma didn't want to let us do anything, so she did it and hired people, and it was terrible or whatever. But in a case like that, if then Grandma passed away and it's an estate um, and her kids are selling it, they have no idea how to fill out a six-page property condition disclosure to be accurate, and that's kind of the rationale behind why an estate does not require it. However, if the property were deeded to her three children then the three children would have to fill it out because it's no longer an estate sale. Uh, in a case like that, it might be that you say unknown, or I can answer this one, unknown on the next one, unknown, because, you, you know. I've seen a lot of unknowns. Yep, yep. And, uh, and so this form is only used when the property condition disclosure is not provided. Um, okay. I used to provide it like every time, regardless I used to tell, I used to throw it in and then the next form would be the property condition disclosure, but I stopped doing it because it's just more paperwork and there's no need to. Um, any questions so far? No. So this is the part where it gets different for different people based on their markets because this form is a contract fill in the, fill in the blank form used by the Clinton County Board of Realtors. Um, the Northern Adirondack Board of Realtors has their own form. Um, you know, you go south and they have different forms down there. And even in other markets, you just fill out a letter of intent. Here's the basic of what we're offering. And then they have attorneys actually draft up like the, the purchase and sale agreement. So it, I think we're been, it, it's more advantageous for us to be able to fill it out because we can get yeah. it quicker than an attorney can get it done because... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, so that's why I think it's more advantageous to us because, you know, we can fill them out ourselves and um, it doesn't take as long. So I'm just going to step through this just so that, you know, we have all the information. Um, so this is a, a binding contract when signed by the, the buyers and then countersigned by the sellers. And that becomes our purchase agreement. So the first thing it does, it lists the parties. The seller, it'll list that. That's usually taken right from the MLS uh, where it lists the sellers or, you know, maybe you have to look it up. But 
for the most part, it's it's listed there. Um, if you knew the home was occupied and that, that that's who was living there, then you can put their address below uh, right here. But if you're not sure or if it's vacant, I usually leave it blank because you don't want somebody sending mail there by mistake. Like, here's a, here's a copy of your attorney approval letter, and then they don't even live there, and nobody gets it. Um, and then, so here's another thing. There are There were tax implications on why they used to put, are you a New York resident, yes or no? Uh, and then, oh, so they took out U.S. citizen here. So that's the most most current change. And I, I kind of had issue with that, too, because I've worked with people who are who live overseas and are citizens of not the U.S. legally. Um, and and by asking them that, I almost felt like like it, it could be a fair housing issue because, oh, well, they turned down my contract, but I had to list that I'm a I'm a citizen of X, Y, Z company. So they it's good to see that they took out um, for the purchaser what your citizenship is because citizenship is a protected class that we just talked about yeah. in well, uh, must be an old copy i have it says citizen, u.s citizen yeah just like it does underneath the uh, underneath the seller they just changed that i think this week or maybe last week so the next thing once uh, and then the purchasers of course if you're a buyer you're you're going to fill this out um some of this information may be auto-populated, but first you're listing the parties and then you're, you're talking about the property. So what property, you know, are we talking about? If it's a home, 123 Main Street, you know, Plattsburgh, New York, 12901, located in the township or city of Plattsburgh. One thing you have to be careful here in our market is, um, like it may be, say, a Morrisonville, New York address but it's located in the town of Plattsburgh. It might be the town of Schuyler Falls. Um, so you just want to make sure that even though it might pull it from the listing, the listing might be wrong. So it's sometimes it's worth pulling up county, county property record real quick just to make sure that it identifies it right. Because if you identify the property for sale wrong, <laughs> you know, then there's kind of issues with that. All right. And then, uh, and then it located in Clinton County, uh, but make sure again because you know when you go south of the river in Keysville, you're in Essex County, so you just want to make sure or Franklin County even to the west. Um, and then said property recorded with the deed recording in the X County Clerk's office, so that's all that's there. And then the listing should have the deed located, like in the MLS. If it doesn't. Um, then you'll, you'll want to call the listing agent and get a copy. Yeah. So the Liber or page, is book and page, is older deeds. That's how they're, they're referenced. Or instrument number. So our instrument numbers, if you, if you pull it from our MLS currently, is three characters short of the number of characters in our instrument numbers. So in our market... It doesn't have the dash zero zero. It just has the year and the six digit, uh, like in like sequential page number. Mm -hmm. But when you're in this block, then you're gonna put like two thousand twenty three dash zero zero one two three four five six, and that's that's gonna be your instrument number. Um, and then said said parcel is identified as parcel number. And you can take this off the listing. Um, you can also pull it up if it doesn't look right, because it's kind of a good practice to like double check because some of this information you really want to make sure is right because you're talking about what's being sold. All right. And then a copy of the deed and the tax map were attached to um, to the offer, right? So the way I look at that is you're going to have when you send this the offer over, you're going to have this document, which is the contract, you're going to have the attachments that are listed at the end, and then you're going to have the deed and a copy of the tax maps right after that. And that fully identifies what's being conveyed. Okay? And now the numbers, we're talking numbers here. So these are 
um, first the purchase price, purchase price, and you're going to put that in here. Um, there are two deposits. You know, I, I kind of debate on, on which ones to do, but it used to be that a copy of the check, the escrow check, would always go with the offer. You'd scan that over with the, the prequal letter or proof of funds. But since COVID, it's pretty much that you don't get a copy of that until after you're under contract. And I think the reason is, as the market got more competitive the last couple of years, is it worth eight people writing checks right. <laughs> to then to then void them because, you know, they all didn't win? So what I've been doing is I've been putting at this line, I've been putting zero. And in here, you want to put something in every block because that way they know it either does or doesn't apply. And nobody's going to pencil it in after. And then in the next block, the additional deposit, I'll actually put the escrow deposit and then do upon contract acceptance is what I usually write in there. Okay. Um, I think, or it might be due a, a, on or before. And I'll write contract acceptance in that block. And then that way they know you're not going to get it with with the agreement, you're going to get it once once we come to agree. And then seller concessions. Seller concessions, the way I describe that to a buyer is um, financing some of your closing costs into the loan. So when we're talking numbers, you know, you know, one of the things you can say to the buyer is, do you have enough funds to close or do you need to finance some of them into your loan? So if they need to finance some of them into their loan, that's called seller concessions. So you offer a higher amount, say 250 for the house, and then 6%, so maybe, I don't know, maybe 8,000 is your seller concessions. So you're really offering them 242 for the house. Because even though the purchase price is 250, you're backing out the seller concessions and the seller, net to seller, is that 242. That's really what you're offering them for the house. If it's if there's not competition, it's been on the market a while. That's not, you know, sometimes that's a good offer. List price minus concessions, and that's really what you're offering. But if if you need if you need the seller to net a certain amount, then you need to go that purchase price plus seller concessions, and it's really hard to do that in a competitive market because, you know, you're also having to appraise at that higher amount because that's the amount you're borrowing. And I've got a spreadsheet that does the calculations on that real easy that I can share with you um, separately. And then the lender's attorney trust account check, cashier's check, or certified check upon transfer of title. So what that means is you've offered this amount. You're putting, a say, 2000 down, no other deposits, no concessions. And then the balance is going to be what you're going to put in this block. OK, so that that's going to be, like I said, it, it's going to be the net so that all of these things here are going to add up to your purchase price. OK. All right. Um, so with that escrow deposit, how much should an escrow deposit be in our market here? It's typically. If you do something that's under say 150,000 in purchase price then you're going to probably have a $1,000 escrow deposit. If you're if you're purchasing something in the 200s you're going to do 2,000. In the 300s you're going to do 3,000. But I've also seen where if if you're doing like say an offer for 350, you're you're probably going to want to do a $3,500 escrow deposit. So that's that's your skin in the game because that's what you could forfeit if you walk away from the transaction for things that aren't allowed in the in the contract. All right. So that's usually what it is. And then land transactions are are, are sometimes different and commercial is different as well. But we won't go into all that right here. And then this part down here is if you have seller financing. OK, instead of a bank, if your seller is going to be the bank and that and in that case, you would put a, a not applicable or a zero here and then you would put 
down here the conditions of which the seller is going to extend financing. And you and I, Will, did one of those where they were willing to do 30 years seller financing, which I thought was completely crazy. But that's where we put in, you know, the amount that they were financing, the amount, how many years, and what percentage interest, and then when the first payment's going to be made. Okay. Because sometimes maybe they agree that, you know, I'm going to do $25,000 down and the first payment's due in six months, you know, maybe something like that. And that's why they have this block here that you can fill in on when that's due. Okay. Time period of the offer. Um, if we don't give the sellers a deadline to respond, then I usually put a not applicable in that block. Um, but a case where you would do it is, um, say it's, I don't know, say it's Friday and we're doing an offer and we want to know by Monday morning because maybe Monday there's a whole bunch of showings. I don't know. Make up a reason. Um, but usually you give them at least 24 hours. Uh, anything before that, you're being a jerk. <laughs> um, so time period of the offer, the date there, and then a, a time a.m. or p.m. And usually, like I'll put here, I'll put five. 500 p.m. just so that it's clear even though it's got p.m. right after it okay escrow funds the escrow is all the escrow deposit the check that we talked about writing is always held by the listing broker unless thing unless the listing brokerage like specifically says we don't we don't do that um and then in that case it would usually be the the seller's attorney um and, and the reason that it's held by by either the, the brokerage or an attorney is because those funds are highly regulated by New York State because those are not like our money if it was an EXP Realty. That belongs to the buyer of the property and that's their down payment. It's not part of the commission and, you know, whatever. And that doesn't go to the seller as soon as they write the check either. Um, so, some sellers have, have thought that. But... Um, so in this case, you would say uh, the escrow agent shall be the listing brokerage will go here. And the depository institution for the account is this bank. And if you if you use um, dot loop, dot loop puts the brokerage in this bottom line instead when it goes in the top line. So that's that's just a mistake in there. Um, but and, and just, you know, read through this and make sure that you understand the language that it's saying. But it pretty much is this this goes towards your purchase. Right. And, and at the front where we showed the numbers, that's what it reflects. And this is kept in a separate account, separate from the broker's operational because it's highly regulated by the state. And that's your money towards your purchase. And that's kind of how I how I tell them that. And then paragraph seven, this is who are the. Who are the real estate brokers involved with bringing the transaction together? And that's important because then that is um, that is essentially how it's going to be paid if if um, the commissions will be paid is because it says in there that, you know, maybe EXP Realty is a listing brokerage and Century 21 is a buyer brokerage. Clear, right? Um, if EXP Realty is on both sides, then in this second one, I'll put not applicable because there isn't a co-broke. Like it says here, it's not a co-broke. Um, it's just with one brokerage. And that's why in the case where EXP is on both sides, I'll put not applicable in this block. And then attorney approval clause. The way I tell buyers that is um, there are several protections for you in the contract. One of them is right here, the attorney approval clause. This clause says that your attorney has a right to approve or disapprove the contract the first seven calendar days that we're under contract. So if we sign, you know, everybody signs the contract on um, Sunday night, sun, the, the last signature is, is day zero. The next day is day one and how you count that. Okay. And it actually says that here now. Day one is the first calendar day following the receipt of the executed contract. So an executed contract is not just when both parties have signed it, but also when that's been delivered back to your party. So if you're working with the buyer and, you know, you get it signed, you give them a copy, that's executed. But you also have to get it back to the listing agent 
so they can get it back to their client as well. Okay. Home inspection. The way I talk about this, home inspection is another protection of, for you in the contract, right? So this is just reminding them that while this is a contract, there are ways that they can withdraw from the transaction and get their escrow deposit back. Those protections are, the, are what we're talking about now. First, the attorney approval, and now with the home inspection. So I preface my buyers with, with this. I tell them that the home inspection is for big things that we don't see when we walk through that we didn't already factor into the, the offering price that we're doing. If we see that the roof on this place is dead and the siding is crap and falling apart and everything's falling apart inside, we're factoring that into our offering price. If we then get a home inspection, it says, oh, the roof's really bad. It's like, oh, the roof's bad. We're going to take more money off it. That's two bites at the apple, and you, you can't do that. Uh, so the home inspection, I tell them, is for those big things that um, that we didn't foresee, right? Maybe they said, um, <clears throat> well, we've had this one. The, ex the bathroom exhaust goes up into the attic. Well, that's something that we can ask them to fix because... We wouldn't have been able to know. I mean, we turned on the fan. We knew it was blowing somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so that might be an ask. But I tell them it's not for this outlet should have been a ground fault circuit interrupt outlet. That's a small repair. <clears throat> Usually one a homeowner can do themselves. But it depends on the homeowner. But it's still a small repair. <clears throat> I tell them that um, I tell buyers that the report that you'll get is is not a repair list for the seller. It's a snapshot of what's going on in the house at the time. And what we're looking for are things that are a safety issue, you know, something that's obviously broke that we have to have working. Like if, the, if there isn't even a furnace or the furnace is broke, that needs to be fixed. Or maybe it needs to be serviced, um, you know, those type of things. If there's an issue on the electric panel... You know, like if it's not grounded properly or something like that, that's going to be an ask. Um, but sometimes you'll have double tap wires and that's where, you know, two wires are going into where one wire is designed to go. That's pretty common. That's not usually an ask. But if you already have other like electrical stuff that you're asking, that might be something that you ask. Um, but I always remind the buyer that it's for the big stuff that we don't see. Right. It's it's for those big things, not not for the little dentinoid, you know, a couple hundred dollars or whatever. All right. So I preface that before I get into this, because I want to make sure that they realize that <clears throat> this part of the contract stipulates how the home inspection works. It, it says that essentially all of the inspections are at the purchaser's expense. Right. So they have to, they have the right to conduct inspections to get a written home, uh, a written report um, from a licensed home inspector, right? Satisfactory to the purchasers. That is wide open because everything can look great and you can say, I don't like it. I'm not satisfied. And you can walk away and get your money back. It's kind of bullshit. Excuse my French, but that is what it is. That's, that's what the language gives us. So you have a total of 15 days. For this contingency. However, the reports must be completed with 10 calendar days following the acceptance of, of the of the purchase agreement. Right. And then again, here again, they say day one is the first day after everything's signed. So you have 10 days to get it done. And then you have five days from the time you get the report for any asks. Either a monetary, you know, adjustment of the purchase price you know, it's like there's really a lot of stuff, but we're not going to have them fix it. We'll just say we want a five dollar credit against the purchase. And then if they, you know, and then so we would send that other paperwork to them and we'll get into that separate. But from the time you get the report, you've only got five days. It doesn't mean you've got 13 days to get the report back and then five more days. You've got 15 days total. All right. <clears throat> and then uh, if if. For whatever reason, the, the purchaser is going to waive the uh, home inspection, then they're going to initial in the block here. And that is essential, essentially saying 
that they're not going to do any of this. My thought is, even if they don't want to do a home inspection, maybe you don't waive it in case maybe you decide on day eight that you want to do it. But, and then I've had it come up where um, <clears throat> the buyer waived the home inspection, but they then during final walkthrough, they wanted something fixed that a home inspector would have normally found, like a ground fault circuit interrupt. And, and we're like, no, you waived the home inspection. No, you don't, you don't get to do that now, day before closing. <laughs> I was, you know, that, that's a little late. <clears throat> so contract is contingent upon financing. I tell buyers, this is another protection for you in the contract. This is, um, this is where we stipulate. Usually the details are filled in, like the type of loan, conventional, FHA, veteran, USDA, whatever. Um, and then the amount of of the of the loan, it's not the purchase price; it's the amount of the loan. So you'll take that from the pre qualification letter. And then for thirty years or twenty years, uh, at an interest rate not more than. Usually in this block, we don't put a number. We I put in the words prevailing rate, because if that says eight percent, and then it goes to eight point one then you're saying that the, this contract is null and void. Is that really what they want to do? Or do they want to you know, move forward? <clears throat> and then another important part, does the seller need to buy, does the buyer need to sell before they can buy? They must sell or they do not need to sell. That's important because it, it makes everything fundamentally different. And we'll get more into that later. <clears throat> Transfer a title. This is um, usually you pick a day that's about 60 days from the day you're writing it. Um, not on a weekend. Um, and not usually on a Monday because I don't think they do. They don't usually do closings on Monday because nobody wants to do a final walkthrough on a weekend typically. So, so usually you're picking a, a day 60 days out. And that's the transfer of title date is on or about. Not It's not a firm fixed day, especially if you're working with, with people who are going to be getting out of a, a rental and moving into their home. You want to make sure they know that this is not a firm fixed date. This is an approximate date based on how long it usually takes to get everything done. But if we have delays in home inspection repairs or, or financing issues or title issues, then that date could get bumped out. But that's just a benchmark. And then um, and then personal property, you're going to check things that may be left behind. The first place I go to look for those is the listing may indicate uh, some of these items. And then just as you walk through, you may see ceiling fans, like the first one, ceiling fans and permanent light fixtures window treatment, including blinds, curtains, and all that, that's usually done by default. Um, smoking carbon monoxide detector, if they have any any um, fuel-burning furnace, stove, or anything, that'll be checked. And then you'll just go through there and, and see which ones um, apply or not. So then there's these two items here, pellet stove and a wood stove. Those... They have listed as personal property, but if you think about it, those are technically a fixture of the house. Those are actually attached to the house, um, usually by way of, of uh, yeah. the chimney. But uh, there, there might be a situation where there's a wood stove that's not. But either way, if there's a wood stove, you want to make sure that you, you check that here. And then one thing with appliances... Washer dryer hookup is different than checking clothes washer and clothes dryer. So if a washer and dryer are included, you check the washer and dryer. If there aren't washer dryers, but it does have a washer dryer hookup, then that's when you're going to check that box. Okay. And then anything that's not um, listed, uh, you can put in the other block. If there's a... Um, like if there's a pool, I think there was a pool. Yeah, pool equipment and chemicals. Um, it used to be that that wasn't um, an option to check. 
So you used to have to write like all pool equipment, including, you know, hardware equipment and chemicals, you know, will be left. So that's um, that's now here as a check mark. Warranty deed. <clears throat> the way I explain this one is the seller has to convey to you, the buyer, um, clean title, free of any liens or encumbrances. That means there can't be any judgments against the property uh, or even the seller usually. Uh, so that's work that they have to do to make sure that, that they can do that is title work that has to be done. They may have a, an abstract of title from when they bought it, but they're... Um, you know, they have to provide to us, um, you know, clean title, free of any liens or encumbrances. And then this one says that conditions affecting title, they have to also convey any any easements or right-of-ways with the property. Those stay with the property. Underground utilities, uh, there might be um, like a deeded access to a property behind the subject property. and And this is just saying that that has to be that has to be conveyed as well. Any easements or right of ways with the property stay with the property. And then abstract of title and title insurance. Um, typically, we we always check block B and then put thirty or forty five days here. And what that's saying is, you know, I mean, you can read through it, but the way I describe that one is. Both parties have work to do in in conveying clean title. And this just says, you know, who and when that has to be done. That's pretty much what I leave it at. Um, and that's from an abstract title in. And then this is going to be the county that we're talking about. The reason that this next part is here asking is the property located in the Adirondack Park is because if the property was subdivided and you're in the park, it has to have had the Adirondack Park Agency or APA approval of that subdivision. So that just lets people know that if we check yes, that we're in the Adirondack Park, that there's a little bit more work that has to be done to make sure that uh, everything with the house is approved and, and clear with the Adirondack Park. Because from the seller perspective, they have to convey marketable title. Well, marketable title doesn't mean that the APA is having an issue because you subdivide the lot and and their issues with how it was done. So that's why this random comment is right here. Discharge of liens. This says that the seller may pay and discharge any liens that they have on the property with the proceeds from the property. The reason that that's in there is because they have to convey marketable title, but they have to use the money from the sale to pay off their mortgage, which is a lien against the property. So because it happens in kind of reverse order, that, that paragraph is in there to allow for that to happen. Okay. Otherwise, you'd never be able to sell a property anywhere because I can't pay off my mortgage until you buy it. Well, I can't buy it until you pay off your mortgage. And that, that's why that language is in there. And that's also one of the reasons that the attorneys write all the closing checks to include paying off mortgages because... Um, you have to make sure that it's done and an attorney is considered reputable and the lenders are willing to do it because the attorney is is writing the check to pay off, you know, the seller's mortgage at the closing table. So the conditions of the premises, this means that any improvements to the property that were with the property when we saw the property is what's going to be conveyed with the property. That means that they can't tear down the garage rip off the decks. If the deck was there when we saw the house, then the deck will be there when when we buy the property. So when they say as is in here somewhere, are sold in its current condition, yeah. Uh, they actually used to have the word as is, but that means something else. So that's that's essentially what it what this paragraph is saying is what we saw when we when we bought it or looked at it is is what's being conveyed to us. Paragraph 18, this is taxes and other adjustments. These are prorations that are that are done back to the seller. Um, the first thing that's prorated are rents and security deposits. So if you're buying 
if you, the buyer, are buying an apartment building and you buy it two-thirds of the way into the month, then you get that last one-third of rent and you get all the security deposits. So that's the first part of the prorations they talk about in A. In B, taxes is a big one. So if you buy, if you're buying a house, the seller has already paid the taxes for the year. So then it's your responsibility from the closing date till the end of the year for the taxes. So that proration is done at the closing table. And usually what they'll do if you haven't, like if you're coming up on the school year, they'll pay all of the year school tax and then prorate back. So they always pay it for the year and then prorate back. And same thing with HOA, Homeowner Association fees. Um, fuel oil and other things. Fuel oil is common in our area. They're 275-gallon tanks, but they're considered full at 260 gallons. So the proration for a half gallon, you know, if the, if the gauge reads a half, um, then it's 130 gallons. And then that's the reimbursed... Um, at the cash price on the day of closing as determined by the seller's fuel provider. So when you list a property, who's your fuel provider? Make a note in your file so you'll have that later. Because then, you know, when you do walkthrough or the day of closing, you need to call and find out what the cash price is on the, on the day of closing. Yeah, we had to pay for our 500-gallon propane tank. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and propane is worse. And at the same point... Um, some homes have two fuel tanks, so they have 500 and, would that be 550? Um, I think, yeah, five, yeah, 550 gallons of fuel. So if I have a seller who has two fuel tanks, I'll tell them, it's like, try and have it so that there's as little, as little fuel in the tank as possible, because that could be a bill well over a thousand dollars that they had not factored in. And, um, and that could, that could tank your closing. I almost had a closing not work just with one tank because they forgot that I told them about that and had to yeah, call their aunt. Like an unexpected $700 bill after closing. Yeah, exactly. Well, at closing. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, pellet, uh, split firewood is prorated back as well. Negotiated between the parties prior to closing. It's worth taking a picture of fuel, split fuel or split firewood and bags of pellets so that you have an idea of what's there. Questions so far? No. Property walkthrough. We are going to do, I tell buyers, we're going to do a walkthrough of the property the day before closing or, or earlier the same day to make sure that Everything is as we expect it to be, that there hasn't been, you know, decks taken apart, all the, all the you know, appliances are there, everything is in working order, um, see how much fuel is in the tank. So we do that right before closing. Um, and that's also to make sure that it's broom clean. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that the carpets have to be shampooed. It just means that it's got to be broom clean. There's no personal property left unless there have been personal property that have been negotiated. Okay? And that's pretty much what it says here. So 20. Th this actually comes up sometimes. This says that everything in this document is the whole agreement to, to purchase this property. And I tell them there aren't any side deals that you've made as a buyer or that I've made as your agent that everything that's being offered is in this document, okay? And, and then any attachments that they have provided or that are, affect the deal are checked off, either yes or no. Don't just check the yeses, but the noes as well. So lead-based paint, if it's, if it's built before 1978, the property condition disclosure, unless it's exempt, um, agricultural disclosure, if it's near or in an ag agricultural zone. You might not be in an agricultural zone, but you might have cornfield or cow fields mm -hmm. like adjoining. And in that case, you know, uh, the, the listing agent should have the seller provide those. Seller concessions, if there are any. And then a 72-hour contingency form, we'll get into that later. 
And then if you're if your property, if you're purchasing the property with either a HUD, HUD financing, uh, FHA or VA, then there's another addendum as well. And then block 22. Block 22 can get you in trouble because this is where it lets you freelance. But you'll remember that we are not attorneys. We're not supposed to practice law. Um, so you have to be careful what you put in here. Um, sometimes, you know, there's just something, um, you know, I, don't know, I hate to even speculate what you would put in here, but say there was personal, say there was just some situation like that you just, that you had to, you had to include and it wouldn't fit anywhere else. This is where it's going to go. But ask your broker, ask your mentor if, if that comes up and you're not sure. And then the purchaser is going to sign it. Usually in like we use dot loop, but there are other signing software. Once, once your client signs it, then you have to usually what I do is I rearrange the documents in the order that I'm going to share them with the listing agent. But even if you're the listing agent, and your client signs, the buyer's agent doesn't know unless you share those back. So there is a little bit of intentionality there. So this says that, um, Pretty much whoever the last person is to sign it, that date and time is considered the contract execution date. And then this form has been a, approved by the attorney for the Board of Realtors. And that, that is why we can use a fillable form because it's been approved by an attorney. And that is how we are not practicing law. We're filling in forms. Okay. Questions on that? Here's the seller concession form if that's used. Uh, it pretty much puts in the dollar amount in two places, which I always thought was kind of weird because since it's always the same. Um, but this is the form that you would attach about seller concessions, and then the sellers have to sign this form as well as the buyers, the purchasers. And so that if says... you wanted to like include fuel oil as a seller concession, you could include that in the purchase price. For allowable expenses, taxes, and fuel adjustments, and prepaid principal, if applicable. Um, okay. It can be done, but usually, so the amount of seller concessions is limited either by the bank or the bank and the type of loan. Mm -hmm. uh, some yeah, are 3%. My buyers, it was like they, they were limited at like $6,000 of seller concessions. Right, but it, it's usually a percentage of the purchase price, not a dollar amount. But um, yeah, but always check with the lender on that because you don't want to put in an amount there uh, because, you know, if you're structuring numbers, well, if we want to offer 240 and we need 240, we need, we can do 8,000, then we're offering them, you know, a purchase price of 248. But if you can only do 7,000, well, the, the seller doesn't get that extra thousand because that's not what we want to offer. So you just want to make sure that the numbers on those are right. Okay. And sometimes a pre-qualification letter will say, that we need seller concessions, but sometimes they don't. So you have to ask so that you, you, you can kind of plan with them how, how to structure the numbers. And then there, these are a couple of disclosures that eXp Realty uses. Uh, one is a CO2 smoke detector disclosure. Uh, and it talks about when the requirements are uh, to use where, where eXp wants this done. My personal opinion is the disclosure is incomplete because if there's nothing in the house that burns a fuel, then the disclosure is not required. Um, be, well, I take it then CO2 detectors are not required. You still required to have smoke detectors, but if you have an electric stove, um, electric heat, electric hot water, and, and that's it in the house and you don't need to do a smoke detector or a a CO2 detector, but you do need to do a smoke detector. But that's just my thought that, but this is the disclosure that's current. And that's where your client signs it. And then we sign as the agent as well. And that doesn't go with the offer. That just goes to um, back in Skyslope, our transaction management software, because that's more for compliance with our broker. Because they're going to probably, they're going to sign one of those forms with their lender documents anyway. And then another eXp Realty form is a wire fraud advisory form. 
the way I describe this is I tell people, read through this, always read through this. But um, this form is EXP Realty wants you to know that if any time through this transaction or any others, the wire money is being wired either to you or from you, that those instructions should be given over the phone and not by email because emails can be compromised and intercepted. And if you wire the money to the wrong place, it's most likely going to be gone forever. And that's why you need to know that. That's kind of how I tell it to them. And then you have your client sign. Okay. EXP again, this is this one EXP requires anytime you have a buyer using a lender. And this is saying that be careful because um, there are always changes to the flood maps, the flood zones, and sometimes your lender even uses ones that are different from the ones that FEMA has. So this is a disclosure that, you know, like I said, this is one that we do in EXP Realty for broker compliance. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to go anywhere else. But it's worth, as, a, as an agent providing this form, you know, read through it, you know, and make sure you're understanding what it says so then you can kind of paraphrase it on how you're going to explain it. So this next form is uh, another EXP Realty form, and I think this is the last one and we're done. Um, EXP Realty has a parent company that owns other companies related to the housing industry, like a lending company and a title company, and their their money that tra that change hands back and forth between those companies that um, have to be disclosed whenever that could happen. Uh, so we're not using success lending or this title company, but um, EXP is providing information on how much they cost, but we're not using them. And you just have to acknowledge that we told you about that by signing at the bottom. And I apologize that we have to do this one, but that's pretty much how I tell them. Okay. okay. Any questions about any of that? No, I went through it previously, so I kind of read through it all and I understood. And having gone through that contract before with the first buyer helped understand it. Cool. Well, good. I'm, uh, like I said, I think it's important to, to at least see how I describe it and yeah, just sure. explain some of the, the behind the scenes on, on why we say this or what it means or why it's there. And then, you know, we'll also do another video that um, that does the same thing on the seller side. 